Welcome to our fourth lecture. This week we're going to start talking about second order differential equations. In particular, we're going to be talking about second and higher order linear differential equations. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at equations like this. Y double prime plus some function of t, y prime plus some function of ty is equal to some function of t. Or we can think of this as a different way. We might see this as a form, a function of t multiplied by y double prime plus a function of t multiplied by y prime plus a function of t multiplied by y is equal to a function of t. These are linear second order ordinary differential equations. Now, if the function small g or capital G is always equal to zero, then the differential equation is called homogeneous. Otherwise, it's non-homogeneous. So in other words, if we have a zero here, that's the, the function which is not multiplied by y or a derivative of y, then the equation is homogeneous. You will note that if we set the function y to be always equal to zero, this is a solution of a homogeneous equation because we would get zero plus zero plus zero is equal to zero. It's not a solution for a non-homogeneous equation. First, we're going to be talking about homogeneous equations with constant coefficients. So first, we're going to be looking at equations of the form a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero, where a, b, and c are numbers. For example, solve y double prime minus y is equal to zero. We want to find some function y of t such that when we differentiate this function two times, we left with the function that we started with. What about e to the power t? What happens to this? What, if we differentiate this two times, what do we get? We get the same function. So yes, we could use this function. What about e to the power minus t? Would this work? Could we differentiate this function two times and still be left with the same function that we started with? The derivative of e to the power minus t is minus e to the power minus t. Differentiate it a second time, <coughs> we get plus e to the power minus t. So yes. We could also use e to the power minus t. What about a linear combination of these two functions? c1 e to the power t plus c2 e to the power minus t. Does this also satisfy the equation? What do we get if we differentiate this function two times? We get exactly the same function. In fact, it turns out that this is the general solution to this differential equation. An initial value problem, solve y double prime minus y is equal to zero. We've now two initial conditions, y of zero is equal to two and y prime of zero is equal to minus one. When we were looking at first order differential equations, we always had one initial condition. We have a second order differential equation, then we're always going to be having two initial conditions. These numbers are always the same. If we had a third order differential equation, we would need to have three initial conditions and so on. Now, we know that c1 e to the power t plus c2 e to the power minus t solves the differential equation. 
So to solve this problem, we're looking for the solution which satisfies both initial conditions. We want to have y of zero is equal to two. In other words, we're looking for the solution which passes through the point x is zero and y is two. Sorry, t, or t, I should say, t is zero and y is two. And when it passes through this point, we want y prime of zero to be minus one. So we want the slope to be minus one when this function passes through this point. Using the first initial condition, that's using y of zero is equal to two, we can take our solution. We can replace t by zero, and we end up with two is c1 plus c2. Next, we need to use the second initial condition. But before we can do that, we need to differentiate our solution. So we differentiate our y to get c1 e to the power t minus c2 e to the power minus t. And then we replace t by 0 to find that minus 1 must be c1 minus c2. We need to find the constant c1 and c2, which satisfy these two conditions. And I'll leave it for you to check that the answers are a half and 3 over 2. So then we know the solution to the initial value problem. A half e to the power t plus 3 over 2 e to the power minus t. Let's go back to the general equation. a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to 0. How could we solve this? Well, in the last example, we, want, we used exponential functions. So we might think maybe we always want exponential functions. Let's try that. Let's make a guess. Let's guess that a solution that we want to use is e to the power rt for some number r that we don't know yet. We can differentiate this two times, and then we can substitute this into the differential equation. Our differential equation is a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero. Replace that by these functions <coughs> and then factor out e to the power rt. We get a r squared plus b r plus c, all multiplied by e to the power rt. And we want this to be zero, but e to the power rt is always not zero. For, so for this equation to be satisfied, we must have that a r squared plus b r plus c is equal to zero. So we've had two equations. Equation one was the differential equation we want to solve. And we found that there's a connected equation, equation two. Equation two is called the characteristic equation of equation one. And this is useful for us, as we saw on the previous slide, because e to the power rt solves equation 1 if and only if the number r solves equation 2. <coughs> so this is how we're going to solve our differential equations. We're going to be using the characteristic equation. We'll find the roots of the characteristic equation, and then we will do e to the power of that root t. Now, a characteristic equation, a r squared plus b r plus c is equal to zero, typically has two roots. We know from school that these roots are minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. <coughs> and there's three possibilities for these roots. Either we have two different real numbers, or we have complex conjugates, or we have real numbers, but the same real number repeated. We're going to need to study these three cases separately. First, we're going to be doing case one. Later today, we will look at case two. 
and then case three we'll save for next week. So let's look at case one. Let's suppose we have two different real roofs. In other words, we want to suppose that b squared minus 4ac is a strictly positive number. After we found r1 and r2, then we know that e to the power r1t and e to the power r2t R2 are both solutions to our differential equation. And then we write down yt is a linear combination of these two functions. This is called the general solution to the differential equation. Okay, that's the theory. Let's do an example. Solve y double prime plus 5y prime plus 6y is equal to 0. The first thing we want to do is to write down the characteristic equation. What are the numbers here? There's the number 1, and then the number 5, and then the number 6. These are the numbers we're going to put in our characteristic equation. We have 1r squared plus 5r plus 6. Just take the same numbers and put them into the characteristic equation. And we want this to be equal to 0. I could factorize this to r plus 2, r plus 3. And then straight away, I can read off that the roots are minus 2 and minus 3. As soon as I know these two roots, I know the general solution to the differential equation. Because the general solution is always a constant e to the power r1t plus a constant e to the power r2t. So this general solution to this differential equation is a constant e to the power minus 2t plus a constant e to the power minus 3t. Another initial value problem. Same differential equation we've just solved, but now with the initial conditions, y of 0 is equal to 2, y prime of 0 is equal to 3. We've already found the general solution to the differential equation. We just need to find the constant C1 and C2, which satisfy the initial conditions. First initial condition is straightforward. Replace T by 0. 2 must be equal to Y of 0. Because E to the power of 0 is just 1, we just get C1 plus C2. For the second initial condition, we need the derivative of y. Differentiate y, we get minus 2 multiplied by c e to the power of minus 2t, and then minus 3 c2 e to the power of minus 3t. <coughs> we're going to take this and we're going to replace the t's by 0 to find that y prime of 0 equal to 3 must be minus 2c1 minus 3c2. Now let's combine these two equations together. For the first one, c1 must be 2 minus c2, substitute that into the second equation, and we can simplify that to minus 4 minus c2. So c2 must be minus 7, and once we know that, we know that c1 must be 9. And then we've finished the problem. We can write down that the solution is 9e to the power minus 2t minus 7e to the power minus 3t.
Let's do another one. Solve the initial value problem, 4y pr double prime minus 8y prime plus 3y is equal to 0, with the initial conditions y of 0 is equal to 2 and y prime of 0 is equal to a half. So what do we do? The first thing we do is we write down the characteristic equation. The numbers in the differential equation are 4, minus 8, and 3. So the numbers in the characteristic equation must also be 4, minus 8, and 3. We can find the roots of this characteristic equation. This time using the equation minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And we find that the two roots are 3 over 2 and 1 over 2. That's all we need to do to find that the general solution to the differential equation is constant e to the power 3 over 2t plus a constant e to the power of a half t. To finish this problem, we need to find the two constants which satisfy the initial conditions. First of all, replace <coughs> First of all, replace t by zero. We find that two is equal to c1 plus c2. Differentiate y and then replace t by zero. We find that a half must be three over two c1 plus a half c2. This is a linear system of two equations and two variables. You know how to solve this from linear algebra. I'll leave it for you to check that the solutions are minus a half and five over two. And that's all we need to do. Therefore, we can write down that the answer to this problem, the solution to the initial value problem, is minus a half e to the power of 3 over 2t plus 5 over 2 e to the power of t over 2. So let's just summarize the theory here. To solve a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero, we need to find two linearly independent solutions. So what we do is we write down the characteristic equation and we find the roots of the characteristic equation. Case one, if the roots are two different real numbers, then the two functions that we want are e to the power r one t and e to the power r two t. The general solution is then a linear combination of these two functions. There's two more cases that we haven't done yet. If the roots are complex numbers, what do we do? I'll show you that later today. What do we do if the roots are repeated? I will show you that next week. Before I go on to case two and to start talking about complex roots, I want to talk more about the theory of fundamental sets of solutions. In this section, we're going to be looking at equations of the form y double prime plus pty prime plus qty is equal to zero. And we're going to be writing this a lot, but I want an easier way to write this, a quicker way to write this. So what I'm doing is I'm going to define an operator L. L will be two derivatives plus PT multiplied by one derivative plus QT. So what I mean is if I write L of Y, that's two derivatives of Y plus PT multiplied by one derivative of Y plus QT multiplied by Y. Or to say that another way, instead of instead of 
instead of using the notation at the top, instead of writing y double prime plus pty prime plus qty is equal to zero, in this section, we're going to be writing just L of y is equal to zero. Anytime you see L of y equal to zero, it just means the differential equation, the blue box at the top. So we have a theorem. If we have two solutions to L of y is equal to zero, then a linear combination of these two solutions is also a solution to this differential equation. And I want to, <coughs> I'm going to quickly show you the proof of this. It's very straightforward. We start by supposing that we know that L of y1 is 0 and L of y2 is equal to 0. And then we use this to show that L of y, and because derivatives are linear, we can show that this is the same as C1 L of Y1 plus C2 L of Y2. In other words, first we show that L is a linear operator, but of course is this is then just 0 plus 0 or 0. Because L is linear, because our differential equation is a linear equation, if we have two solutions, we can take a linear combination of them and we still have a solution. Another tool we're going to need is the Ronskin. The Ronskin of y1 and y2, which we can write as w of y1 and y2 and of t. This is the determinant of the two by two matrix, y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. And if I'm being lazy, Instead of writing the whole y1, so w of y1, y2, t, if I'm lazy, I will just write w. And I'll assume that you know that that really means the thing in the middle. <coughs> Theorem. Suppose that we have two solutions to L of y is equal to zero. And suppose there exists at least one t where the Ronskin is not zero. Then this theorem tells us that C1 y1 plus C2 y2 contains every solution of L of y is equal to zero. So if we can find two solutions, and if there exists a t where the Ronskin is not zero, then we can just take a linear combination of them, and that will be the general solution to our linear differential equation. C1 y1 plus C2 y2 is called the general solution to L of y is equal to zero. And in this case, if, if we can use y1 and y2 to write down the general solution, then we say that these two functions form a fundamental set of solutions to L of y is equal to zero. An example, show that t to the power of a half and t to the power of minus one form a fundamental set of solutions to 2t squared y double prime plus 3t y prime minus y is equal to zero. And just so that we don't have to worry about dividing by zero, this is just for positive t. To answer this question, we need to do three things. We need to show that t to the power of a half is a solution to this differential equation. We need to show that t to the power of minus one is also a solution to the differential equation. And we need to show that these two functions are linearly independent. In other words, we need to show that the Ronskin is not zero 
somewhere. It doesn't have to always be non-zero, it just needs to be non-zero at at least one point. So let's do step one first. Let's show that t to the power of a half is a solution to this differential equation. What we do is we substitute in t to the power of a half into the equation. We want to get zero. We want 2t squared multiplied by two derivatives of t to the power of a half, to the, to the power of a half plus 3t multiplied by one derivative of t to the power of a half minus t to the power of a half is equal to zero. And when we do these derivatives and cancel everything, we do get zero. So yes, this shows that t to the power of a half is a solution to this differential equation. Then we need to do the same thing for the second function. We also need to put t to the power minus 1 into our differential equation and see, do we get 0? And I'll leave it for you to check that when we do these derivatives and we cancel everything, again, we get 0. So this slide proves that these two functions do solve the differential equation. There's one more thing we need to do. We need to show that they are linearly independent. We need to use the Ronskian. The Ronskian of y1 and y2, that is the determinant of the two by two matrix, y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. Put everything in calculate the determinant and then simplify, we get minus 3 over 2, t to the power minus 3 over 2. And remember, we're only interested in the equation when t is strictly greater than 0. So this is actually always non-zero. <coughs> we didn't need it to be always non-zero, we only needed it to be non-zero at least one point. And and at least one point, in fact, at every point, it's non-zero. So our two solutions are linearly independent. So we've solved this problem. We've answered this question. We've done the three things that we had to do. We've shown that y1 is a solution. We've shown that y2 is a solution. And we've shown that these two functions are linearly independent. In other words, we've now shown that they form a fundamental set of solutions to this differential equation. And then that brings us to the third and final section of today's lesson. What do we do if we have complex roots of the characteristic equation? Let's go back to our second order homogeneous linear differential equation with constant coefficients. And now we want to look at the case where the roots of the characteristic equation are complex conjugates. In other words, we want to look at the case where b squared minus 4ac gives us a negative number. Then the two roots of the characteristic equation are going to be complex conjugates. I want to write them like this. I want to write them, the first one is lambda plus i mu, and the second one I want to write as lambda minus i mu, where lambda and mu are real numbers. Then we would have two solutions, e to the power rt, or e to the power lambda plus i mu t, would be the first solution, and the second solution would be e to the power r2t, or e to the power lambda minus i mu t. But wait a minute, what does e to the power of a complex number mean? We have a formula due to the famous mathematician Euler. 
e to the power of lambda plus i mu t means e to the power of lambda t cos mu t plus i e to the power of lambda t sine mu t. You might be thinking, why? Why do we want to do this? Let me show you why. Let me show you what happens if we differentiate this formula. I want to differentiate e to the power of lambda t cos mu t plus i e to the lambda t sine mu t. Using the product rule, we're going to end up with four terms. First, the derivative of e to the power lambda t is lambda e to the power lambda t, and cos mu t stays the same. And then when we differentiate the cos mu t, we get minus mu sine mu t. And then we move on to plus i e to the power lambda t sine mu t. Don't worry about i. i is just a number. Imagine we had number 3 here, number 7 here, number 100 here. We would just ignore it when we differentiate. i is just a number. Don't have to worry about that. All we need to do is we need to differentiate the t terms. So again, we differentiate e to the power lambda t to get lambda e to the power lambda t. Sine mu t stays the same. And then we differentiate the sine mu t to get mu cos mu t, and e to the lambda t stays the same. Let's simplify this. First, let's put the cos terms and the sine terms together. Lambda plus i mu, e to the power lambda t, cos mu t. plus i lambda minus mu, e to the power lambda t sine mu t. What can we do next? Well, there's a minus here. And let me just remind you that minus 1 is the same as i squared. So we could imagine that we have plus i squared just here. And then we could factor out an i to get an, uh, one i on the outside and one i on the inside. This, is, this term is the same as i multiplied by lambda plus i mu. This bracket appears twice. We can factorize this out. Lambda plus i mu multiplied by e to the power lambda t cos mu t plus i e to the power lambda t sine mu t. But this is exactly the same as r1 e to the power r1t. So even if r1 is a complex number, still when we differentiate e to the power r1t, we get r1 e to the power r1t. That's why this equation, that's why this definition of e to the power of a complex number makes sense. That's great, but that's not what we want. y1 and y2 are functions which map from the real numbers to the complex numbers. If we put a real number t into these functions, then we're going to be given a complex number. And we don't want this. <coughs> we want real valued solutions. In other words, we want functions which map from the real numbers to the real numbers. So what can we do? Remember that if we have two solutions, then every linear combination of these two solutions is also a solution. So I could do a half y1 plus y2, and I could do 1 over 2i y1 minus y2. These are both linear combinations of y1 and y2. So these are both still solutions to the differential equation. And if we calculate these, a lot of the terms cancel. Looking at u first of all, 
there's a plus i sine mu t and then a minus i sine mu t. These two are going to cancel. We end up with a half cos plus a half cos or one cos. Ut is just e to the power of lambda t cos mu t. And for vt, we have almost the same thing. There's a cos mu t and then a minus cos mu t. These are going to cancel out. We're left with I sine minus minus I sine. In other words, we're left with 2I sine. And then we divide by 2I and we end up with e to the power of lambda t sine mu t. <coughs> so U and V are both functions which map from the real numbers to the real numbers. And because they are both linear combinations of y1 and y2, that means that they must both solve our differential equation. Great, but are they linearly independent? To answer that, we need the Ronskian. So we do the determinant of the two by two matrix, u, v, u prime, v prime. I'll leave this for you to check at a later time. When you rewatch this video, when you read the lecture notes, just check that this is correct. And you'll, you'll see that you get mu e to the power two lambda t. Now, because we have complex numbers, because our roots are complex numbers, that means that mu must be non-zero. If mu is non-zero, and of course, e to the power of 2 lambda t is always non-zero, that means that the Ronskin is non-zero. So the answer is yes. These two solutions are linearly independent. What do we say when we have two linearly independent solutions? We say that we have a fundamental set of solutions. And if we have a fundamental set of solutions, then we can use them to write down the general solution to our differential equation. If we have complex roots of the characteristic equation, then our general solution is going to be a constant, e to the power of lambda t cos mu t, plus and then the same thing, but with sine instead of cos. OK, that's the theory. Next, we'll do an example. Solve y double prime plus y prime plus y is equal to 0. First, we need the characteristic equation, and we need to find the roots of the characteristic equation. Because the numbers in the differential equation are 1, 1, and 1, the characteristic equation must be r squared plus r plus 1 is equal to 0. Put that, these numbers into our formula. We get minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus 4 divided by 2. That's the square root of minus 3, or we can think of that as the square root of minus 1 multiplied by 3. Square root of minus 1 is i, and square root of 3 we just leave as square root of 3. So we find that the roots are minus a half plus or minus i, square root of 3, divided by 2. So now we know lambda and mu. Lambda must be minus a half, and mu must be root 3 over 2. And as soon as we know lambda and mu, we can write down the general solution to the differential equation. 
because it always looks like this. It's always a constant. e to the power lambda t cos mu t plus a constant e to the power lambda t sine mu t. Put the numbers in and we find that this is the solution. And that's it. That's all we have to do. It's one slide to find the solution to this differential equation. Let's do another one. Solve y double prime plus 9y is equal to 0. The same method, we start with the characteristic equation and we find the, the roots. The roots here are plus or minus 3i. In other words, we have that lambda is 0 and mu is equal to 3. As soon as we know that, we know that the general solution is c1 cos 3t plus c2 sine 3t. And that's it. That's two sentences to solve a differential equation. It really is that easy. Let's do an initial value problem. Solve 16y double prime minus 8y prime plus 145y is equal to 0 with the initial conditions y of 0 is minus 2, y prime of 0 is minus 1. First we'll find the general solution to the differential equation. We'll do that by writing down the characteristic equation, by finding the roots to the characteristic equation, and then just as soon as we know that, we can write down the general solution. And then in step two, we'll find the constant C1 and C2, which satisfy the initial conditions. <coughs> so the characteristic equation, the numbers are 16 minus 8 and 145. So the characteristic equation is 16r squared minus 8r plus 145. And using our formula, we can find that the roots are a quarter plus or minus 3i. I've written it like this because square root of minus 1 is i, straightforward. Square root of 64, we know. Square root of 144, we know. And then once we've cancelled everything, we end up with a quarter plus or minus 3i. So lambda must be a quarter and mu must be 3. As soon as we know that, we can write down the general solution to a differential equation. All that's left is to find the two constants. The first thing I want to do is I want to differentiate y. Just use the product rule. The derivative e to the power t over 4 is a quarter e to the power t over 4. The derivative cos 3t is minus 3 sine 3t, etc. And then I want to replace t by 0. And we're lucky when we have cos and sine because a lot of the terms just go to zero. Looking at the gray formula at the top, sine of zero is zero, so we can forget all about the second term. Cos of zero is one, forget about that. E to the power of zero is one, forget about that. We just find that minus two is equal to C1. And then do the same thing for y prime. 
side is zero, forget about that. Side is zero, forget about this. Sorry, that's a mistake. Where was I? Side is zero, forget about this. Forget about sine zero. Cos is equal to one, forget about that. Cos is equal to one, forget about that. E to the power of zero is one, so forget about that. E to the power of zero is one. And what are we left with? We're left with a quarter C1 plus three C2. I'll leave it for you to check that we must have that C1 is minus two and C2 is equal to a half. And then we know the answer to this problem. The solution to the initial value problem is minus two e to the power t over four cos three t plus a half e to the power t over four sine three t. This is the solution to the differential equation which passes through the point zero minus two and which has slope equal to one at this point. Let me show you a graph of this solution. It passes through the point zero minus two. And the slope here is minus one. Here's the, sorry, the slope is one. Here's the slope is equal to one. And it turns out that this, this solution looks like this. Let's just recap what we've learned in today's lesson. To solve a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero, we need to find two linearly independent solutions. <coughs> so what we do is we write down the characteristic equation and we find the, find the roots of the characteristic equation. And then there's three cases to consider. If we have two different real numbers, then the functions that we want are e to the power r1t and e to the power r2t. That's straightforward. <coughs> yeah. If instead we have complex numbers, then we want different functions. We want e to the power lambda t cos mu t, and we want e to the power lambda t sine mu t. There's one more case that we haven't done yet. What do we do if we have repeated roots? I will show you that next week. Next week, we'll start by looking at what we do when we have repeated roots of the characteristic equation. Then we'll move on to the method of reduction of order. And then finally, we'll talk about non-homogeneous equations and a method to solve non-homogeneous equations, which is called the method of undetermined coefficients. Are there any questions?